Good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I'm joined today by the Chair of the Committee on Health. Uh, today, we'll discuss the city's cooling tower inspection regime with testimony from the administration, advocates, and other interested members of the public. We'll hear a package of bills that would strengthen the city's oversight and enforcement of policies to prevent Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is, a usually, is usually caused by inhalation of the Legionella bacterium, which is naturally present in our environment, but thrives in poorly maintained cooling towers used to provide air conditioning. According to the CDC, those who are older or have a, comprised, a compromised immune system are at a higher risk of getting sick when exposed to the bacteria. Although worth noting, between 2015 and 2017, the incidence of Legionnaire's disease was highest among black and Latino New Yorkers. Finally, Legionnaire's disease is most common in neighborhoods experiencing high levels of poverty, and cases have been on the rise. In response to the 2015 Legionnaire's outbreak that affected 133 residents and resulted in 12 deaths, the Council passed Local Law 77, which requires owners cooling towers to register them with the DOB and develop plans for their maintenance. For their maintenance. It also requires regular inspections and provides clear and strict guidelines for building owners if a test indicates that microbes are present. Local Law 77 was set up in the right direction, but its requirements and enforcement have ultimately been insufficient as outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease continue to disturb communities throughout the city. Today, I hope that we'll make substantial progress towards stepping, stopping this disease once and for all. So it's just me and you. I'd like to uh, uh, have remarks from my co-chair, Mark Levine. Thank you, Chair Carnegie. Uh, exciting to finally be uh, kicking off our first joint hearing together. Hopefully it will be the first of many. Um, as the Chair mentioned, I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and uh, pleased to discuss this important topic today. Uh, Legionnaires is not the disease which kills the most New Yorkers by a long shot. Uh, th those uh, unfortunate titles would go to conditions like heart disease and stroke and cancer. But because of the fact that you can contract Legionnaires by breathing, people are understandably scared. And we don't minimize that, and we take it very seriously. Um, this is an issue which uh, appears to be uh, mounting in severity in New York City and nationally. Uh, as uh, the city's data shows, the number of cases is increasing. Um, there are a lot of possible explanations for that, uh, both here and nationally, um, but that trend has also uh, been a source of alarm to many New Yorkers. Uh, my own concern uh, on this issue, uh, which would be considerable as it would be for any New Yorker, and especially for the chair of the Health Committee, uh, has been heightened by the fact that we've had not one but two clusters in my district uh, just in the last couple of months. Um, we've had unfortunately 50 people approximately who have contracted the disease in these two clusters and tragically so far um, there have been two deaths in these clusters which we take very very seriously. Um, the recurrence of a cluster in almost exactly the same location um, causes me to ask whether there could be defects in the equipment. Uh, I know that DOH is asking that same question. This strikes me as a question that we haven't explored adequately and haven't accounted for perhaps in our broader strategy uh, to combat this disease. Um, and I think I, I, I speak for everyone when I say we need to stop at nothing to understand the source of Legionnaires to uh, mitigate it when there are uh, clusters or outbreaks, to prevent future clusters and outbreaks, and of course to keep the public informed in every way possible. Uh, passage of Local Law 77 in the last term um, really catapulted New York City into the forefront nationally, uh, perhaps even internationally, and in how we track and combat Legionnaires. And uh, we acknowledge that, but today is about asking uh, what we can do to be even better, what we can do to better enforce the existing law, and what ways do we need to make, as Chair Cornegie said, the existing law even stronger. Uh, we're looking at a total of four bills today, uh, really focusing on strengthening the inspection re regime. I'm pleased to be uh, sponsoring intro 1158, 
which would require um, the commissioner of DOHMH in conjunction with the DOB to hold information sessions at least twice annually for building owners uh, regarding maintenance, cleaning, and inspection of cooling towers and to post the information online. Um, we want all building owners to be informed about how properly to care for cooling towers and to ensure that all New Yorkers, especially those who are most vulnerable, are protected from harmful exposure to Legionella. To Legionella. I just want to take a minute to um, correct a couple of the rampant misperceptions about Legionnaires, which I'm sure uh, uh, the Commissioner will be addressing. One is to clarify that there's a difference between cooling towers, which are these bulky, modern-looking things that run central air conditioning, and good old-fashioned oak water tanks. And we're actually doing another hearing on the water tanks issue, um, uh, I believe next week, or and, and when is that? On the 30th. Um, that's about your drinking water. Legionnaires is an airborne disease. So I just want to, from the outset, and I myself sometimes get tripped up over the, the language, but we're talking about cooling towers and other sources of Legionnaires. Um, it is true that not every case of Legionnaires comes from cooling towers. Um, some of them can come from hot water systems, and some come from other sources that we might not even know. Uh, so we'll talk about that today, but just want to make sure we, um, we understand that. And the last misperception, which is just we can't repeat enough, this is not a contagious disease. You don't have to worry about a patient with Legionnaires sneezing on you or hugging you or anything like that, um, because that's not how this disease is spread. Uh, so a little bit of relief for New Yorkers who are worried. Um, I am very pleased that DOHMH is here um, with two very capable uh, senior leaders. I have to say that I'm disappointed, Mr. Chair, that DOB is not here because DOB does have a role in administering these. So perhaps um, you folks can explain why that is. Um, but I would have liked to have seen a representative of DOB here to join um, the leadership of DOHMH. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Barry Gredenchik from the Great Borough of Queens. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yes, sir. Um, so we, if you could affirm the testimony of the administration. Do you, affirm to, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. <coughs> So we'll, we'll begin with a round of questions. Um, I'll start. Uh, the, CD, the CDC projects. Oh, you might want to let them testify first. That's a, nov that's a novel approach. I'm going to try to answer right. some of those before we start. <laughs> Great. All right. All right. All right. It's, it's one so, of those mornings, I'm sorry. Please begin your testimony. Great, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairs Levine and Kornegi and members <laughs> of the Health and um, Housing and Buildings Committees. Um, I'm Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, the Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm joined by my colleague, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health. On behalf of Acting Commissioner Oxiris Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on cooling tower systems and Legionella pneumonia, also known as Legionnaire's disease in New York City. Bacteria, including Legionella bacteria, are found naturally in the environment. Although many species of Legionella exist in the environment, just a, fe just a few are known to cause human disease. These bacteria are acquired by exposures to water mist in nature or by human-made water systems. When inhaled into the lungs, the bacteria may cause Legionella pneumonia. Legionella pneumonia, as you heard, is not contagious, so it is not passed from person to person, nor can it be acquired from drinking water. Most healthy people do not become ill if exposed to Legionella, and Legionella pneumonia is treatable with common, well-tolerated, and often oral antibiotics. Legionella pneumonia is most commonly acquired by individuals with risk factors that may make them generally more susceptible to pneumonias, such as having chronic lung disease or a weakened immune system, or being over 50 years of age or a tobacco smoker. Although the vast majority of cases of Legionella pneumonia are sporadic and related to unidentified natural or human-made environmental exposures, cooling towers are recognized as one of the water systems with high potential for dispersion of Legionella-containing uh, water mist. To review, 
Cooling towers or water systems found generally throughout, though not exclusively, on the top of buildings <clears throat> and are responsible for regulating the temperature of cooling systems such as central air conditioning or refrigeration. These towers release water mist or vapor into the environment in order to regulate the temperatures of building cooling systems. Although the vast majority of cooling towers perform these functions without threat to human health, these towers may provide Legionella bacteria with an ideal environment for growth if not correctly maintained. With proper maintenance, including the use of chemicals or biocides that sterilize the water, these conditions may be disrupted and bacterial growth can be prevented. In 2015, after an outbreak of Legionella pneumonia in the South Bronx, the administration and council worked together to enact Local Law 77, which for the first time in the United States sets standards for cooling tower system maintenance for building owners and enables the city to better reduce and contain Legionella in cooling tower systems. In 2016, the department created a new office to oversee building owners' compliance with the local law, promulgated agency regulations setting out detailed implementation requirements, and expanded the department's laboratory and disease surveillance activities and cooling tower systems um, regulatory oversight capacity. We hired a highly skilled team, including specialized water ecologists who perform annual inspections of registered cooling tower systems. New York City now has the most rigorous cooling tower oversight in North America and is seen as a national and international <laughs> model for this work. The department's water ecologists annually inspect all registered cooling tower systems. These highly trained staff inspect all cooling tower equipment, assess the chemical treatment of the water in the cooling tower systems, and review maintenance and operational records, including water quality testing records for Legionella bacteria. These inspections are conducted to determine compliance with Local Law 77, and summonses are issued to building owners who fail to comply. To improve compliance, the department also provides training, technical assistance, and resources for building owners, cooler cooling tower operators, and water treatment vendors, including guidance on how to safely bring the systems on and offline. Since 2016, the department has performed over 11,000 inspections covering over 6,000 registered active cooling towers. In addition to cooling tower system oversight, we have a comprehensive disease surveillance system in place to identify and monitor disease. The surveillance system identifies possible cases of Legionella pneumonia in New York City, and it combines a review of mandated reportable <laughs> disease results with syndromic surveillance, which is information such as patient symptoms and use of medications that signal the possible presence of disease. We receive mandated reports on approximately 100 different diseases of public health concern, including Legionella, and daily reports of syndromic data from emergency departments, urgent cares, EMS, EMS, pharmacies, and school nurses. Day in and day out, our expert staff work diligently to analyze these data from these sources to, to identify any signals that may indicate a potential increase, cluster, or outbreak. Legionella pneumonia is one of the diseases for which we get automated lab reporting, meaning we are notified of every positive test for Legionella in New York City and we investigate each case through interviews with patients or their families and a thorough review of their medical records. <clears throat> On a daily basis, advanced computer algorithms are used to rapidly identify patterns of Legionella that may suggest a possible cluster of infections to be investigated for a common source of exposure to the bacteria. This system takes into account time, space, and expected numbers of Legionella pneumonia to determine the possibility of what we call a community cluster. Community clusters are most suggestive of a single source, such as that resulting from a mist generated by a contaminated cooling tower system. Cooling towers are the most commonly identified source of Legionella pneumonia in New York City. When our disease surveillance indicates an unusual cluster of Legionella pneumonia, the department quickly mobilizes to investigate that geographic area. While in the field for investigation efforts and on a routine basis, our experts are looking for cooling towers that may not be registered by observing surrounding rooftops and analyzing online satellite imagery. During an investigation, water ecologists are dispatched to collect samples of water from the cooling tower, review cooling tower system records to assess the compliance with maintenance requirements and perform compliance activities. If a water sample tests positive for Legionella bacteria, the commissioner issues an order to require timely disinfection, cleaning, or other appropriate corrective action. 
We typically investigate several community clusters each year and are currently investigating a community cluster in Lower Washington Heights. The two prongs of our approach, cooling tower system oversight and disease surveillance and response are complementary to each other and enable us to quickly identify potential community clusters and work with property owners to ensure that issues are addressed immediately. We also encourage New Yorkers to seek medical attention for flu-like or pneumonia symptoms such as fever, cough, or difficulty breathing. In the event of a cluster, the department actively conducts outreach in the affected area via media alerts, community meetings, and on-the-ground outreach to help ensure awareness and vigilance by community members, and we send health alerts to medical providers citywide. Before turning to the legislation, I want to reiterate some key messages for the public. New York City's drinking water supply is safe, as are home air conditioning units. Walking into air conditioning environments is also safe. This council has been instrumental in helping the department disseminate this messaging to New Yorkers, and I want to thank you for your commitment. Regarding the bills being considered today, Introduction 1164 proposes mandated reporting on cooling tower oversight and Legionella pneumonia cases. The administration fully supports the intent of this bill and is committed to transparency for New Yorkers. The department issues an annual report on cooling tower system inspections and is happy to expand upon that report. The department is also creating a public-facing website to provide information about building-specific inspection results that we think meets the intent of this bill. This website should go live in early 2019. Introduction 1158 requires the department to provide education and information to building owners and operators about cooling tower maintenance requirements. We support this bill. The department currently hosts a regular cooling tower academy and community-based education sessions, and we have an online self-assessment tool that has been very helpful for building owners and compliance improvement. Introduction 1149 requires the Department of Buildings to digitize the certification process and send an electronic reminder to building owners and operators in advance of certification deadlines, and it requires owners to send inspection results directly to the Health Department. The administration supports the intent of updating this process to be more user-friendly and streamlined. We have concerns about using a pre-populated certification form, as this form provides important operational <laughs> information that may change year to year, such as components of the maintenance program and plan and staffing, and we want the owner or operator to take the time to complete this form accurately to help improve compliance with the law. We look forward to speaking with Council further regarding this proposal. Finally. Introduction 1166 would require the department to conduct an assessment of potential determinants of Legionella pneumonia in the city and report on these findings to the council. We support this bill and welcome the opportunity to share findings for the department's existing and robust surveillance system. Thank you for, your, for the opportunity to testify on this issue today and we're happy to take questions. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna kick it off. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I do, I do want to reiterate my, um, my concern that the agency that's charged with receiving uh, certifications from uh, building owners isn't here. Um, the reason why uh, Chair Cornegy and I are co-chairing the hearing is because the bills go through both committees because there's agency work. Both agencies do work. Um, can you offer any explanation for why DOB is not here? I'll start by saying that we are in, in communication with Department of Buildings and have uh, a really ongoing communication. And I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Corinne Schiff to uh, go deeper into that. Okay. So we work very, uh, we work closely with the Department of Buildings. We designed uh, together um, the the structure for for registration. Um, we uh, we think we can hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, including those that, that might uh, relate to uh, Department of Buildings work. If we can't, we're happy to pass that on to them and we will pass on um, your concerns about um, them not being here as well. I will say that uh, they, while they have responsibility for registration and certification, as you note, we, are, we, we do collaborate. So when we're out in the field, for example, and we find a tower that is not registered, um, there's a violation that we can issue. We do that. We work with the owner to, to register, and then we refer to the Department of Buildings. So there is um, connection between the two agencies. Okay, I'm sure, I'm sure you're very capable of answering most questions, but I'll, and I'll move on, but I, I, I want to register my feeling that 
they should have at least had uh, a person here in the room available for questions, uh, which, which will inevitably come up. Um, I, I, I want to emphasize that uh, having now worked with, with both of you and your teams on two clusters uptown, um, it's pretty clear we have surveillance systems that are uh, world class. Um, I, I have a lot of confidence that we're catching uh, Legionella cases and that we're responding very quickly uh, to uh, identify suspect tanks um, and to communicate to the public. Um, I think our concern here and the point of this hearing is how to prevent it ever getting to that point. Our, our ideal world is that we, we don't need you to have to spring into action because by then, by definition, people have already gotten sick, right? Uh, the incubation period of the disease and, and the nature of the disease is by the time your red lights are blinking and, and mission control, uh, people are already sick. Um, and so the goal is to prevent you ever getting to that point. And that's really what this is about today um, and what these bills are about. Um, and I'm pleased that we're joined by uh, two members of the, the Housing Buildings Committee, uh, Fernando Cabrera from the Bronx and Alika Ampri Samuel from Brooklyn. Thank you both. Um, I, I have learned to parse uh, the language of the administration when you talk about bills. And so for 1164, when you say uh, you supp support the intent of the bill, I've learned to read that as being something short of a full support. And in fact, I was pleased by contrast on 1158, you just said you support the bill. So uh, 11, uh, 1164 again is um, mandated reporting, reporting on cooling tower oversight. And could you explain why you're a little bit short of unreserved support for that bill? If indeed you are. Yes, yeah, so, so we do, um, we support the intent. There are some, I think we're very close. Um, we, as, as uh, was mentioned in the testimony, we are building a, uh, a very user-friendly website that will report um, inspection information. And so there are pieces of the bill that would require us to report the same information that's on the website in, the, in, in a report to you. And so we want to think with you about whether that makes the most sense or it makes more sense. Uh, there'll be thousands and thousands of entries um, to do that on the website. So I think we're very close and it's really some, some um, probably what we would, you could think of as nuance um, on, uh, to, to get to uh, uh, an agreement. Okay, so then on, on 1149 you were uh, uh, even more reserved. So on 1149 um, we, you know, we understand and we appreciate the um, the notion, uh, which I think is to make it easier for um, for building owners to get in the annual paperwork. Some of our uh, uh, concerns we have, for example, is um, it's it's designed intentionally to kind of um, not to be so easy. We want to almost sort of press pause there. We want the building owner to take that moment annually to think about um, is my maintenance program and plan, which is really the key to the, um, the environmental health program, um, is there anything that needs to be updated? Have my staff changed? Did I learn anything in the past year that make me want to um, tweak my plan? And so we're concerned that just having kind of a pre-populated, something that's too easy, skips that very intentional step. So again, I, you know, I think we, um, there's a lot in the, in the bill that we, we understand, we appreciate. But so um, just to jump in, so you think it's make, that bill makes it too easy for the building owner? So parts of because it- Because it's pre-populated, the form? So, right, so parts, so parts of it are sort of boilerplate. We understand that. We might be able to, you know, we'd like to think with you about whether we can, we can do that. But we don't want to pre-fill everything because it's designed not just to be a form that you submit, but it's, it's intentionally designed to be a moment because otherwise every year you just sort of keep your plan in place. But the point of that exercise is for the building owner to, to reflect on the past year, make sure that there's nothing that needs to be updated. So there's really a kind of a, as a, a, a sort of press pause at that moment. So we, we, we appreciate, we don't, we're not, we don't want, 
this to be burdensome in terms of filing, um, but we want to make sure that we don't go too far. So we'd like to think with you about how we can meet your goals of not being burdensome, but also making sure that we um, ha ask uh, owners to take that moment to make sure that last year's plan is ready for this year. Okay. Um, I, I want to air some of the big picture facts here because there's a lot of confusion about it. How many cooling towers are there in New York City and how many do you estimate remain unregistered at this point? So there are just over 6,000 uh, uh, that are registered with us under our jurisdiction. Um, you know, it's an important question, how many are unregistered? We really feel that since, um, since the council enacted local law, um, 77, we're closing in on the end, on the end of the unregistered. As you, but, as but in both, in both the clusters of my district, you identified unregistered towers just in that little neighborhood. So there must be many around the city. So, so we, so that's probably true. I don't know about many, but there are certainly some. And I'll tell, let me tell you how we approach that, um, as for in two, in two ways. First, as part of our routine work. Our water ecologists, those are our inspectors, as part of their routine inspections, they are trained to look around um, as they're doing those inspections to do um, a visual inspection of the surrounding area, looking for uh, cooling towers that we may not have. And when we identify those, we kind of work with that owner, we figure out what that building is and br to bring those kind of on the grid, you could say. Um, in the cluster investigations, it's an important part of, of the work. Our inspectors are out there doing the activities that Dr. Dasvalak has explained, but also looking for towers that we don't know about. As we have gained experience, it's also part of why we do this, uh, this public outreach that, that you also described. We want to get the word out because we want people to seek uh, medical care early, but it's also an opportunity for us to be alerting uh, building owners in the community that if you have a cooling tower and you're not registered, that's a problem, we need you to get registered. So we're, we're doing all of these different activities. We also continue to look at um, satellite, satellite imagery. We can't answer the question, how many do we not know about, but we think we're getting closer and closer to that full, uh, that full And, and this, this matters because we have this great regime, we passed a law, Local Law 77, um, to mandate inspections and reporting and cleaning if necessary. But if the owner just ignores the whole thing and doesn't even report the existence of the tower to the city, then they could be doing nothing there. And that, that's scary when, because we know Legionella could thrive in that scenario. So what are the, what are the penalties, if, if we discover an unregistered tower, what are the fines, what are the repercussions? So a failing to, failing to register a cooling tower um, before it, uh, operation is a $2,000. Um, fine. I should add also another strategy that we are using is to work with um, trade organizations, um, the vendors who are part of this process as well, who provide um, the services to the building owners. Um, so it's, as you note, it is a key part of, the, of our enforcement um, activity and it's a key part of the program working and we think we're really um, getting to the end of the um, group that is not registered. Okay, so for those that are registered, uh, the mandate is uh, weekly inspection. Is that right? Okay, help me out here. It's week. Is it weekly inspection? So there, there. I think there's a couple ways to think about this. The most, imp the, the crux of the requirement is that every building has to um, develop a maintenance program and plan. And we have, we do a lot of technical assistance about that. There's a template um, on our on our website. Um, that is tailored to every building as it needs to be because every cooling tower is different, buildings are different, the usage is different. That plan, so there are, and there are requirements for different types of uh, routine maintenance that are set out in the local law and in our regulation, and then an individual maintenance program and plan might add to those and make additional routine um, monitoring. Okay, so uh, in, in other words, your answer is it depends? based on the size of the unit? There's sort of the a de there are defaults that are in the regulation, and then it depends. There can be additional things depending on that particular operation. Is it mostly, uh, for, most, for most units, is it a weekly inspection? Um, I, I don't know about most units, but I can say that the law does require certain things to be done weekly. There are different, the, uh, different types of activities are on different cadences. Got it, okay. Um, so, 
uh, for, for, for those units that are registered, how many health violations are we actually issuing for failure to inspect or failure to clean? So we, we, um, we received that question at, at the end of the uh, day yesterday, and we'd like to actually get back to you and, and make sure we're understanding um, that question, because it's hard to say what you mean by, by inspection, because there all are all of these different kinds of activities. So we have reported, we report to you annually. Um, we're in the middle, obviously, of 2018. We don't have all those data yet. Um, but it, I think it would, might be more productive if we had a chance to, to, um, to follow up with you we're happy to get all of that information to you. It's on open data, and, and as we noted, but, so, sorry. What, what's the ambiguity there? Just any, any violation related to a cooling tower? Do you want to know total violations related to cooling towers? Yeah, yes. Total violations related to cooling towers. Okay. We. I don't know that we have that number. Wh which number do you have? I don't know that I have. We don't have the number because we didn't understand exactly what your question was asking. I'll see if we can. I don't know that we can get that right now. I'll see if we can get it. If we can't, we'll follow up. With you, but but what, what, why was that an ambiguous question? Because the question was um, violations for inspections. What other categories of violations of are there? Towers. Well, so um, you know, failing to use uh, uh, so sufficient quantities and combinations of chemicals not added as specified in the maintenance program and plan. So, so not not cleaning so it properly. You mean? Is that what there's that a, is? There are, there's a long list of violations. Um, what you mean by inspections? So we're, we're, we're happy to provide the information. It's on open data. We're building a website to, to make it transparent. We would just like to be, be sure that we're understanding and answering your question. If the question is total number of violations issued, I can see if we have that. I don't know. Um, it seems like maybe someone's going to jump in to save us here. So we can find also what we what we submitted to you in the annual report, which would be the 20, um, we'll get, we'll get 17. Give us a minute. We'll, we'll the, the people are really scared about this disease for reasons that I explained earlier, right? You, anything that you can catch by breathing, people are scared about. There's a ton of misinformation. And I think one of our most important jobs here at the council is to um, just give people the information they need to understand the scale of this and what the city is doing to fight it. Uh, so these kinds of questions are super important. It looks like you might have an answer for me. So what we can uh, provide right now is the number that we reported in our annual report for 2017, which was a total of uh, 75,822 violations. So that's a really big number. Right, that's in 6,000 units. So you're averaging 11 or 12,000, you're, you're averaging 12,000, 13,000, sorry, 12 to 13 violations per unit. Uh, I don't have the per unit average, but I, but I also think But you said 75,000 and it was 6,000 units. But it's, Im le uh, it's important also to, think, to, to note the types of violations. Um, almost uh, 43,000 uh, plus of those were for general violations. Those are really um, sort of more like record keeping violations. Um, critical violations were 26,000. And the public health violations, which are the ones we're most concerned about, um, were 5,000 violations. Also recall that that's the very first year of the program. So it's the first year that we're out there. It's the first year um, that we're, we're checking on all, all um, registered cooling towers. And there's a learning curve. In any new enforcement program, we're not going to see instant compliance. That's, I, I, that's I certainly hope and expect, and expect that'll come down. But uh, what are the are there fines attached to each violation? There are fines. The council um, in Local Law 77 set out a penalty range, and the department has set uh, fixed penalties, a penalty schedule in our regulations to be sure that there's consistency. Those violations are heard um, at, at oath, and we wanted to be sure that the um, penalties imposed are consistent no matter, for example, the borough that the, that the um, operator has the, um, the violation. Right, the and pre presumably the, the fines heard. go up as you, if for repeat offenders, is that right? You go up for repeat offenders, and they're also tied to the public health importance. So um, the public health hazards, for example, um, failing to have a maintenance program and plan, which as I noted is sort of the crux of, of the entire uh, system, that's a $1,000 um, violation. And they're typically... Um, 
uh, doubled for, for repeat violations. The fine structure um, for this program is, is high. Um, operating a cooling tower is, is expensive. Um, so we think that combining high penalties along with our really robust education program, um, which is why we're also supporting the education bill, I, is really the way for us to um, drive up compliance. And, and look, I, I get it that this is the first year and there's a learning curve and we're going to be anxious to get 2018 numbers as soon as you have them, even partial year. But what we see a lot of times with building owners is that they take these fines as a uh, a cost of doing business. And, you know, a thousand here, two thousand there, they say, well, you know, it's just what are you going to do? Of course, in this case, that is public health implications, so that would be really bad if that's what's happening. So um, I have to say it's, it's, it's really worrisome to hear uh, a regulatory regime in which we're averaging 12 to 13 violations per unit, and that uh, it makes me think makes me worry about landlords just being cavalier. And um, so I think it's really important that that number come down or something is not working right. So we're, we're also looking forward to it coming down. I will, I will say that I don't, I don't think it's fair to characterize um, the building owners as being cavalier, um, as, as shown by, for example, um, the, the educational programs that we have, we call Cooling Tower Academy, where we have hundreds of owners uh, uh, building uh, operators, uh, vendors turning out to learn about what our, um, what our requirements are, how to comply. So I think we're, they're on a learning curve. Um, we're there to provide technical assistance and ongoing education. We do that at every inspection. We've our, our, the self-assessment tool, which I think we've so far gotten really great feedback about. We launched that in, in February, so that's new too. Um, the, when we have clusters, all of that outreach is also a signal to building owners. This is important. Um, so we, we really do feel like everything's going in the right direction. We see more and more buildings with um, maintenance programs and plans in place. Um, so no, I think what we were able to present to you in 2017 was year one. I'm going to pass it off to my, to my co-chair in a second, just to finish up on this point. Um, what, what is the rate at which, uh, what would the term be? What, like, what's our collection rate on these fines? Are all 75,000 paid? So that's and, a question. What, and what's we'll the dismissal rate, if, if that's also relevant when they go to oath? So we'll have to, we'll have to get, th that some of these questions are oath questions, so we'll have to get back to you. So they're oath questions. So uh, um, meaning that you don't necessarily have that data? You don't have DOH? I don't have it? collection rate data with me. I don't have dismissal rates with me either. I'll say that in some of the, um, some of the way that we issue violations, we're ask, we are saying that, there, for example, there are not, you don't have documents, and they can come to oath and produce those documents. So even our um, summonsing, summons plan, that in itself promotes immediate compliance. But we'll, have to, we'll get you those numbers. As it so those happens, we have the chair of the Committee on Government Operations here, and I believe oath reports into your committee. So um, we, we, I think we need to find out whether it would be really scary if they're just not paying the fines or if they're all being dismissed. That would indicate something defective in the system. So uh, we definitely need to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to pass it off to Chair Cornegate. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, so I want to begin by also um, expressing my concern and disappointment in the absence of DOB as the chair housing and buildings. I had a reasonable expectation that DOB would be here so I could direct my questions um, from a Department of Buildings perspective uh, directly at them. Um, you seem to feel like you can answer those, que field those questions, so we're, we're going to uh, ask around the questions that were tailored for or to be answered by DOB. Now let's see how this goes. So does the city provide notification of property owners when a certification date is due? Um, we have been providing courtesy information to building owners. I'm sorry, I couldn't we've hear been, you. We've been providing information to courtesy, uh, as a courtesy um, to building owners to remind them of the, of the annual certification. So can you just describe for me what that looks like, what the, what the, um, uh, how it's administered, uh, in what methodology? Are, is it a mailing? Is it an email? Is it a text? <clears throat> 
just give me a minute to get that detail. We send an email. Do you know how many emails constitutes an actual outreach? How we would define outreach? I mean, how many emails would we define as outreach? We email, uh, I assume we email every bit. Let me just check. Hold on. So we do, uh, we email everyone that we have an email address for. Um, it's an online process, so we're, we have good email information. So speaking of that, uh, DOB now has the new self-service self online tool to view permits and review filings. Can this new system send reminders to property owners? Is that the way it happens? Is that it happens through the online system once they've registered? All right, so I'm assuming that a building owner registers with the system, the new online system, and then from that you can generate a, a correspondence with that building owner. So we will have to ask uh, DOB to get back to you about their particular system. Um, we're sending emails out through the registration system, um, which, which we are able to manage. So I'm reluctant to even continue in this line of questioning if those simple things can't be answered. And this is not your fault. This is just an illustration of why it would have been important to have DOB here. And I'm a little distressed to find out that that was a conscious decision on their part that was made prior to the hearing, and we weren't, made, we weren't notified that that was going to be the case. Right? So not to beat you up. But certainly I'm going to um, uh, have some questions directed directly at DOB for making a conscious decision not to be present and not informing my office as the chair that that was going to happen prior to t this morning. Um, I will defer my questions now to my colleagues. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much uh, to both of the chairs and for your leadership and for all the sponsors of these bills. And I'm already checking with my office to try to get you that answer, hopefully during this hearing. Uh, thank you uh, to both of you. And I want to uh, express my thanks uh, to the work that you did at For Independence. Uh, you were responsive. I can't say the same thing for Nisha. Uh, you were always there and you always got back to us. Uh, can you give me, uh, uh, just briefly, because I have a couple of questions here, uh, what was the final outcome uh, in regards to foreign independence? If you have that <coughs> answer right now, it would be very helpful. <clears throat> um, so the Fort Independent, um, thank you for your question. Um, so the Fort Independent houses, um, the e evaluation began in August, August 30th. Um, there were two cases um, that were identified within a 12-month period. Um, based on that, um, we did a routine building investigation of the water, which means that um, we work with uh, engineers to identify places in the building where we sample water to see if there's evidence of Legionella bacteria. Um, we did do those samples, and the environmental cultures were positive for Legionella. Um, a letter was submitted, um, and then subsequently um, remediation was requested. Um, as well as uh, post remediation sampling. So I think we are still in the process of, uh, of working with the building. One of the things that's important about building investigations is the, the answers never come very quickly. So what'll happen is um, we evaluate the building, we'll get the water samples, then it takes two weeks for the cultures to grow. So that's an important comment. So when we do building investigations, we get the water samples and there's no quick test to identify Legionella. So what we do is we, uh, we, we put the water on culture, it grows. When it grows, we then work with the building and with engineers to come up with a plan to try to uh, address the fact that Legionella is growing in the system. Um, after something is done, a remediation step, we then have to resample and then resample again. And if we see that there's a trend that Legionella, uh, the amount of Legionella is going down or clears, we then work with the building to make sure that they have a plan for ongoing maintenance of the building. So where are we <clears throat> and what week are we in terms, uh, so we went through the two weeks. Uh, are we are waiting for the four weeks. So uh, I think I, the second stage is four weeks, if I understand right. Yeah, let me just double check.
while, while you're getting that answer, I do want to acknowledge the presence of um, both Council Member Helen Rosenthal and Council Member Bill Perkins. So um, we, we're still working and, and we're in the middle of the investigation and so uh, we have limited sort of updates for you at the moment except that we're working with the building to make sure that their, that their uh, um, plan is working and we're gonna be resampling. So it's one of those that we're still in the midst. So the reason I'm asking, I'm gonna bring this to attention to um, my two chairs today, is because of the very thing that you just mentioned that I think is critical. It, it, it baffles me that we have a process that we, you have to have at least two people identify uh, to make it, I guess, a crisis, right? Uh, so you can go ahead and investigate, taste the water, and so forth. Uh, wouldn't it make, then we have to wait all, those, all that time before we start cleaning the water. I mean, cleaning the pipes, cleaning, you know, the tank. In this case, it was the pipes. It was not the water tank, as uh, I was informed. Doesn't it make more sense because, as a matter of fact, let me, before I even ask, I'll finish with this question, what's the percentage of buildings where at least two people were identified? Uh, you know where I'm going with this. Uh, where two people were identified and it was proven positive coming from that building. So this is a really great question and really does frame the answer to your next question. Right. So every year we identify between eight to 10 buildings with two or more cases of Legionella in the same building within one year. Um, so if you sort of look at scale for a moment, thousands and thousands of buildings in New York City and every year we find around eight to 10 that potentially have cases that could be linked to the building. But the next sentence that impo that's important about our finding is critical, which is that we've not actually ever linked a building's water directly to cases. So the work that we do is actually hypervigilant. So if we see the potential of, of, of disease in a building because of a couple of cases within 12 months, we mobilize an effort that is uh, designed to make sure that that water is, is healthy, the hot water system in the building is healthy. So even though we don't have a link directly between the building and the cases, we take that as a signal. And uh, you actually commented about it being a crisis when we have two, it's actually not. It's really one of our very routine investigations that we do um, in an abundance of caution. So in effect, we, we don't really ever have a sign so far that building water has actually been connected to any of these, uh, you know, duets of cases that we see in buildings, but we don't, we don't want to wait to see a third and fourth case. So even though we don't have that proof, we're hypervigilant. We have this really aggressive uh, stance toward investigating building water. So even though we can't prove that there's a connection, um, it's important to go in there and investigate when there's a signal. So I go back to that other comment again thousands of buildings in New York, and we only see eight to 10 a year. So from the perspective of scale of the problem, investigating every building's water supply probably doesn't make a lot of sense because also Legionella is a bacteria that is in the environment and it would not be surprising to find it in water. That's where it likes to be. So really the disease signals uh, tend to be ways that we can target places uh, that really focuses our, our effort and resources on really what the size and scale of the problem is. So so help me understand, doesn't it make sense that once there we identify, just like we found at Four Independence, right? We had two people. Doesn't it make sense at that point, instead of waiting to test the water and so forth, because you know, what are the chances when you have two people in one building that is not related to the building, that at that point, for example, NYSHA will begin uh, the cleaning procedure uh, instead of waiting to another four weeks or whatever it takes, what, the, so your your department, what do you what do you suggest? Do you think this is a good idea to go ahead and to start cleaning right away when you have at least two people? So we we really start with the first phase, which is if we identify a building that has two cases within 12 months. Um, our first step is to work with the building to identify ways to, to see if there's even Legionella in their water. So sometimes the answer is there's not Legionella in their water. And the case is, especially in, in really big buildings, so imagine thousands of people live in, in this, in this uh, development, um, just 
by chance alone, we could have two cases in those building not connected to the water. So what we do at a first step before we sort of create a, a lot of, 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 of you know, recommendations not based on, on data is that we tell people, we don't really know what's happening with the water yet, we're working out that now, but in the meantime, if you're over 50, if you're a tobacco smoker, if you have chronic diseases, if your immune system is low because of HIV or because of any medicine that you take or cancer chemotherapy, um, you should try to avoid things that produce mist where you could be exposed right. to Legionella. And so we tell people, you know, you should potentially think about not showering and taking a bath instead. So that's like a really, it's sort of a stepwise strategy. So then if we do find Legionella in the water, then we really kick into overdrive and say, you know, let's let's make sure that your water is healthy and we can sort of make us a, a, a plan. Last question, yeah. and thank you so much uh, for the time, is how expensive is it to clean either towers or if it's, there is no towers in the pipes? Or in the shower heads. I, let me. I want to just add one point of clarity. Your questioning is great. It's cooling towers don't cause uh, those double cases in buildings. So it's 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 when we see the pattern of multiple cases in a lot of buildings in a geography, we got uh, cooling towers now because we're super cautious. If there's a cooling tower in a building that has uh, a, a water investigation going on because of those couple of cases within 12 months, we'll grab a sample from those cooling towers just so we know, gotcha. even though that's not how people get those cases all in one building. Um, so from the perspective of, of how much it costs, I'm gonna defer to um, our environmental crew to see if they can give us an estimate. Um, I think that, that what I can say while they're working on it is that um, there's, there's gonna be different interventions uh, based on what we see. So you know there could be interventions as simple as increasing the temperature, which is probably not very expensive, and then more complex interventions where systems are placed to sterilize the water, a, a sort of copper-silver system that is more costly, um, that creates an environment less conducive to Legionella growth. But let's see if we can have a cost estimate come to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's exactly right. I mean, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because it's ver it's just really variable to to the system. Um, you know, for for a cooling tower and and the the, re the remedial choice, um, which also depends on the particularities of the situation. So it's just a really hard question um, to answer. Um, I can tell you that for a cooling tower, um, if it can, it can be as much as ten thousand dollars. So yeah. it but but it can be less. So it's just. It's a hard question to answer because it just really varies. I understand. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, your, your answers were very helpful. Thank you so much for the chairs. Thank you. Uh, so I just have a brief question, Mr. Daskalakis. Are you a medical doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, so this whole time I've been uh, not referring to you with your correct title. You can title. call me Dimitri. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize for Don't that. Don't worry. <clears throat> not a problem. And, and I just wanted to ask um, if the threshold or if the trigger point for cleaning is not two, what is the trigger? Uh, and excuse my ignorance, this, is, oh, no, uh, this is a joint hearing and these health issues I haven't come before me before. Great question. So if, if the question's been answered before, I apologize, but I'm curious. Maybe what I should do is back up and talk about how our surveillance works and how that triggers our investigation, and then that'll sort of get us down the road. I think that's probably the best way. So we, uh, at New York City Department of Health has uh, the most robust surveillance system for Legionella of, of any jurisdiction. So um, I'll sort of back off, back up and tell you that um, that when we, when there's a positive test result in any laboratory in New York City for Legionella pneumonia, we get that report in an automated fashion um, into our, into our uh, Bureau of Communicable Diseases. So we know by name, by hospital, and then ultimately by address where the person lives. How long does that take? It's, it's nearly real time, so within usually 24 to 36 hours. So we get that report, um, and what happens is then we have astute epidemiologists who look to see where the cases are. We also have very great computer algorithms that look at how those cases interact in time, space, and then also to compare how much Legionella happens in the area regularly versus what's happening at the moment to see if there's a signal for something going more beyond sort of the baseline ambient level that happens just because Legionella bacteria are everywhere and people do get Legionella pneumonia, though they way more commonly get other pneumonia 
pneumonias um, that are vaccine preventable like influenza and pneumococcus. So that's another important comment that other pneumonias are way more common and preventable. So when um, we get the signal, we're able to sort of look at them geographically, but not only in neighborhood, but also to the level, level of building identification number. And so when we find uh, that there are two cases within 12 months within a building, uh, a building um, it then triggers a communication between the epidemiologists and the folks uh, in environmental health to come up with a plan to uh, 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 pursue the building and talk about doing an evaluation of their water. When we see a pattern of two cases within one building, that's different than when we see a pattern of multiple cases in multiple buildings over a geography. So when we see a couple of cases in one building, that triggers the idea that there may be something in the building's uh, hot water system that may be exposing people to Legionella. Versus when we see uh, Legionella cases in a broader geography, such as what we're seeing in Lower Washington Heights, um, in multiple buildings over an area, that then triggers the idea that we need to look for something that's creating mist in the environment. And the most common thing that does that is cooling towers. So back to the building. So when we see two cases, um, the two cases could be sporadic, which means that they're not related to the building, or they could be related theoretically to building water. So we err on the side of caution and pursue the building water to make sure that the water, the hot water system is, is not colonized with Legionella bacteria. What that means then is that our, our water team goes in um, and works with the building to come up with a plan to sample the water. The water is sampled and um, is then sent to the laboratory for culture. So why culture and not some other tests that may be more rapid at identifying Legionella? We don't really care about dead Legionella. We only want to know if there's living Legionella, and only living Legionella grows on culture. In fact, Legionella is all over the environment, and if a building um, has a water system that's, that is doing its job, it should kill Legionella, and so it's really important to see whether it's alive or, or dead. So if it grows, it then triggers uh, conversations with the building and with uh, contractors that they have to come up with a, a plan to, uh, to um, address the Legionella levels in the water and do whatever is appropriate for that specific water system, hot water system, to address the issue. Um, we use the threshold of two cases because we don't want to investigate buildings just for a sporadic case. So if there's something really going on with the water theoretically, you'd expect to see more than one case. And we've set our threshold really, really permissively. So we're not looking for a couple cases in one or two months. Um, any case, even within 12 months, if there are two of them, triggers the investigation. So we're erring on the side of over... Uh, investigating buildings, and even with that threshold being such as it is, we investigate about eight to ten a year. Oh, thank you. And lastly for me, um, why is it then, because it seems very scientific, which I can appreciate and respect, why is it that there's an increase in uh, black and Latino communities and directly associated with poverty? I don't know how, you know, theoretically that can correlate with the scientific way that you're describing the presence of uh, Legionnaire pneumonia. So working on health equity throughout the city is really one of the core tenets of what we do at the Department of Health, and Legionella investigations and work are, are actually no different. Um, from the epidemiologic perspective, um, I want to first talk about just how diseases in general map to areas of poverty in New York City. So um, when you think about Legionella, it's not just about bacteria and mist, it's also about who's breathing the mist. So just to remind you from our, um, our epi uh, data brief, which, which thank you for, for showing that off, I'm glad that, you, that, that you're using that, um, that's the intent, um, that people who are older, people who are smokers, people who have chronic diseases, and that includes diabetes and lung disease, are potentially at higher risk for Legionella. What you'll see is that when you look at the maps, and I come from an infectious disease space with, uh, with disease control, I also think of HIV, um, these diseases tend to correlate really well with areas of poverty um, because you know, of issues of health access, et cetera. So um, I think that um, one of the explanations for why it's happening more commonly in those areas is that we have more people who are potentially susceptible uh, to Legionella where they live. Um, the second point, which I think is really important, is that all of this work that we're talking about here today, Local Law 77, and all of the conversations about, about improving um, how we're approaching uh, cooling towers is actually really critical in the story of how to change that. 
Um, rather than sort of looking at cooling towers and saying cooling towers that are in areas that are affluent are getting really well serviced versus those that aren't in affluent areas are not getting well serviced, this law creates an equalization, a standardization of how cooling towers are addressed, which I think is a really key step in addressing the inequity that you've really accurately pointed out. So just to be less, uh, less science-y about it and just to be straightforward, it's about host. Like the people who are at risk potentially also live in high higher poverty areas and may also be um, black or Latino, which is one of the reasons that you see that signal in, epi, in our epi data brief because of, of also the prevalence of these other uh, comorbid conditions that put them at risk for Legionella. And then I also want to comment again and also thank the council that the work that we're doing to improve uh, um, maintenance of these cooling towers is actually great equity work because a tower in uh, in upper Manhattan needs to be held to the same standard as a tower in Midtown. And this is what this does, sort of creates that equity moment to try to improve the health of, of New Yorkers no matter where they live. Well, I thank you for bringing me up to speed in that period of time. You didn't take one breath, it seemed like, the <laughs> entire time. But but it also demonstrated the, the passion that you have for this work, which uh, I appreciate. Thank, thank you. you. I just want to pick up with a couple questions. Uh, given that we know certain populations are more vulnerable, tends to be older populations, more low income, and unfortunately, uh, disproportionately, people of color, that almost perfectly describes who lives in NYCHA. And we've had several incidents of what we think are cases arising from the hot water systems. Uh, in St. Nicholas houses, particularly just outside of my district, and uh, one or two other developments. It's, it's in the district of, of my colleague here, Councilman Perkins, thank you. Um, it seems to me if there's anywhere, yes, we have a million buildings in the city, I think that's the number, right? So that would be a lot of inspection, but if there's anywhere we're gonna focus our resources, it would be in those buildings where people are the most vulnerable based on the criteria that you, you identified. So it seems to me we should be upping the game in NYCHA. And I got to tell you, as the council member probably knows, in St. Nicholas houses, people are concerned. And they feel like if they're older, um, that taking a shower where you breathe in the mist is a risk. And you know that there were two cases on the campus. And they then flushed out the systems. Um, we're joined by Council Member Barron uh, on the Health Committee. Thank you. And um, they, we flushed out the systems, and apparently then a subsequent test came back positive. So uh, you can understand that an elderly person in that situation is going to be scared to take a hot shower because of um, the possibility they could breathe in the mist. I understand that statistically the likelihood of, of someone uh, contracting it, e even even someone who's elderly, if they're not otherwise dealing with smoking or chemotherapy or something else, is very, very low. But, um, you know, th those fears are understandable. What, how could we up our game? What would that look like to up our game in NYCHA? Is it pro more, more proactive testing, uh, not waiting for an incident of two cases in the building? What would it mean to proactively up our game in NYCHA? Um, I think our baseline of what we're doing is actually upping the game. So compared to any other jurisdiction, our surveillance is the most robust. Um, you know, I, I go back to the comment about, you know, there are a million buildings in New York City, and even with populations that are potentially uh, more immunocompromised or have other risk factors that may put them at risk for other pneumonias, including influenza and pneumococcus, um, we're not seeing signal to the magnitude that would, that would say that we need to change the scale of the response, at least in my opinion. So we're, despite the fact that we do have a, a, a couple of NYCHA buildings that we're currently evaluating, I also want to step back and think about the size of those buildings. And, you know, the fact that, so for St. Nicholas, for example, that's a really good example. Um, so St. Nicholas has a couple of cases that happened in, in that complex. Um, it happened in separate buildings, and those buildings don't have connected water supply. So based on that, 
um, you know, from our perspective, um, we're talking about a lot of people living in one space and the statistical possibility of having sporadic cases in that building is high. And from the perspective of how the water system works, though um, I'm not a water engineer or water ecologist, um, we don't have a linked water system in that building. So uh, it's potentially that we have chance alone that has put those, those cases in that giant structure. I think it's 10 or 13 buildings. It's a really large, uh, large complex. And with a rate of five, one to five cases per 100,000 for Legionella pneumonia. Um, and so biologically and structurally, um, those cases aren't linked by a water supply. Uh, I think this is an issue we're gonna wanna continue to push on. I certainly am for this uh, extremely vulnerable segment of the city. Um, and again, I understand our surveillance is world class. Uh, the question is what can we do to uh, prevent uh, any of these uh, cases even coming up on mm. on your radar. I do, I do want to plug one thing, which is that those populations are at exquisite risk for pneumococcal pneumonia and influenza, which are which are way more frequent. So just to compare Legionella, five in 100,000 people um, in New York will come down, may, may have Legionella, that's a rate. It can be up to 250 per 100,000 for, uh, for influenza. So I think one really important message if folks are listening is definitely um, that if you're uh, at risk, um, you should have a pneumococcal shot. That means age over 65 or comorbidity morbidities, and also everyone should get the flu shot. 80,000 people in the U.S. died of the flu last year. Right. Um, so it's really a, an important message, especially for populations everywhere in New York, but I think it's a great message for NYCHA because you're right, there are more susceptible populations there. Um, I, I do want to ask about the equipment here. Oh, and and uh, did you want to jump in, Council Member? P please. Uh, if you want to use the mic, so can you? That, that's a nice term. What, what does that mean in, in common language? So, from the perspective of um, of, of uh, water uh, of cooling tower uh, maintenance, well, I can just back up and sort of explain it again. I think. I'm trying to yeah, no problem. <laughs> the, the, so, the equity angle, right? Yeah. 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 So, um, so first, we'll talk about cooling towers and sort of what the importance is of the local law that has really st helped us standardize how we approach cooling tower maintenance in New York City. So, you know, I think the point of it is that a cooling tower in an affluent area of the city needs to be maintained in the same way as a cooling tower in a less affluent area of the city. And before this law, we really didn't have a sense of what was going on at these, uh, in, in, the, in these cooling uh, towers. I, mean, it, I, I, I apologize for interrupting. So a cooling tower in an affluent has to be equal to a cooling tower in a less affluent. Right, it's maintenance. I thought it would be the other way around. If whoever has less should be equal, equalized to who has the best, not the we're best saying the same. To the less. We're saying the exact same thing. And so I think okay, maybe I, I I'll be clearer. Because it sounded kind of ass backwards. To yeah. Me, so let me I'll say it. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll unwind it a little bit more. Okay. So the standards that we hold towers in a affluent part of the neighborhood um, need to be the same as this. So let me flip that. The standards that we hold a tower in a less affluent part of the neighborhood need to be identical to the standards that we hold uh, towers in a more affluent part. So it's exactly what you said. Okay. And so that I think is different and has been changed by the local law because before the local law, we really didn't have our, our, our finger on the pulse of what was going on in towers all across the city. And so now, no matter where the tower is located, they have to hit a set of requirements to demonstrate that their maintenance is adequate. And so from my perspective, looking at equity, uh, really by saying that these, these towers in less affluent parts of the city and towers in more affluent parts of the city are set to the same high standard, I think that's how we're going to see over time uh, an improvement in the disparity that we see in Legionella. Let me ask one more quick question. So in, in some of these communities that, that, that where it's not so much equity, there's also the, the, the asthma issues and other respiratory kind of issues that I would imagine aggravate the, the, the possibilities. So how are we factoring that into our efforts to remediate or to eliminate 
this type of crisis? So um, your question is great, and it, it does reflect that really it's not just about the towers and the mist, but also about who's breathing it. And so the fact that people who are over 50, who are tobacco smokers, who have chronic lung disease and asthma potentially can count as one of the chronic lung disease. Have Some of our communities are chronically asthmatic. Yes. By the Department of Health standards. Yeah. Yes. Um, How are we focusing on those type of communities that tend to be sort of over exposed? Yeah. Um, so the first is to make sure, so it, our, right, we do have the most robust strategy for maintenance of cooling towers in the nation, if not the world. So the first step is to minimize the risk of possible exposure to Legionella from sources that we know could potentially cause it. Um, with that said, it's important to remember that Legionella bacteria are actually all over the environment and it's, it's n not possible to 100% prevent exposure to Legionella. Um, it's everywhere. Um, so, you know, the answer really is that where we know there's risk, we need to do what we're doing now to improve uh, the, the, cooling t uh, the cooling towers maintenance because that in long term will prevent, uh, you know, a place where Legionella could potentially grow and disseminate. Um, I'll go back and say that among as asthmatic populations, I'm, I, I am a doctor, I see patients, and I have plenty of folks with asthma, and they're at higher risk for pneumonia in general. So I think that as we're dealing with, uh, with cooling towers to make sure that they remain healthy, um, another really important message to our asthmatics, um, a couple important messages, is that if you're not feeling well and you have asthma, it's important to go see a doctor because before it gets too far from the perspective of an, ex an exacerbation of that asthma, seeing a doctor could actually um, help interrupt it from getting worse. And also, it's worth getting evaluated um, because people who have chronic lung disease have increased risk for pneumonia. Um, I'll remind you again that, um, that you know, Legionella causes about two to 500 cases of pneumonia per year in New York. We estimate that about 35,000 people are actually admitted to the hospital every year with pneumonia, and many of those are preventable by influenza vaccine and pneumovax. And so independent of age, um, having chronic lung disease is an indication for a pneumonia vaccine. So I think the answer is from a Legionella perspective, um, really hankering down on these towers and making sure that we're really um, following local law 77 and, and have an increasing adherence um, to good maintenance no matter where in the city is important, but then also, you know, the baseline message of get your vaccines because you're going to prevent the way more common causes of, uh, of pneumonia. One quick final question. So are we mapping, like, where it's really a problem community and where it's less so so that we can sort of strategize a, a, an attack that says the, 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 the rates of this problem are going to be higher in these areas? And there's a campaign that focuses on those areas to inform those families that, so, by the way, with all due respect, you might have a higher rate potential of this than someplace else, and therefore we want to inform you and, yeah. and help you understand how best to protect yourself, especially your children and your elders that are most vulnerable. Are we looking at that as a, an, a, as a, as an approach that makes some kind of so, health sense? So we're, um, one of our strongest suits is surveillance and telling people what's happening with, infe with uh, infections and other diseases. And so the first thing I'll point out is our epi data brief that actually gives this in really high level detail around neighborhoods where, where um, Legionella and populations uh, where Legionella may be on the rise. And also, again, I, I, I just go back to introduction 1166. And so I think that, that, um, that this introduction um, also um, would encourage us to sort of do this more. And I think we're very supportive of being more transparent with, uh, with our data. So the answer is yes. Thank you, council member. And I want to acknowledge we've been joined by our colleague on the Health Committee, Councilmember Keith Powers. Um, regarding this equipment, uh, these cooling towers, is there not uh, a filter or some other mechanism that could capture the mist so that it doesn't waft out into the neighborhood, potentially infecting people? Um, the, the equipment, um, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of cooling tower um, equipment, and there are um, techniques uh, to reduce and uh, reduce mist, I think is what you're asking. I'll have to get back to you whether there's literally a piece that, that, that captures that. Um, 
but they're just, there's a variety of towers and, and selecting them um, depends for the building as it's being developed on the needs of that building and the operations of that building. I don't think that there's a, a, a quick fix like that, which is why Local Law 77 was so important. There may not be yet, but we should really be monitoring the cutting edge on this. Uh, the prospect of a technological solution um, would solve a lot of problems and seems reasonable. I don't see why you can't capture a mist. Um, is, is it not possible that a defect in one of these units could make it susceptible to repeat uh, infection? You know, I, I look at two outbreaks, two clusters, in almost exactly the same location in uh, southern Washington Heights. And, I mean, we only get like two clusters a year in the whole five boroughs. The odds of that happening in the exact same location just two months apart are like 6,000 to one. And it, it, I can't think of any possible explanation other than the fact that you have a defective unit, that even if you maintain it and monitor it and clean it, there's something wrong and it just becomes a hotbed of Legionella again. And is, is that not a phenomena that we're aware of? And if so, that opens up a whole new line of, of inquiry to make sure not only that we're cleaning these things, but that we're monitoring whether they break. Well, I'll start and say that we're, we're still in the midst of the investigation in Lower Washington Heights, so we don't really have any um, you know, definitive answers about um, if there is a repeat source. Um, I'll just remind, I mean, something that we talked about when, when this uh, cluster began again is that we, we uh, act aggressively even based on preliminary data before we actually know the full story because it does take time. So I think and, and, that's and important. Sorry to interrupt. I don't need you to reveal an ongoing investigation. I, I look forward to hearing whatever you come up with. But this, has this concept not occurred to DOHMH? I mean, maybe it, it, the problem is it overheats in some capacity, and Legionella loves that. Um, maybe there are cracks that allow the bacteria to get in or out. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an engineer, but uh, is, this, is, this not, is this concept not even one that we've grappled with? Is this not, are we in new territory here with a cluster in the same location that's, that's never happened before? So um, we, this is our first experience of a community cluster in the same location. So um, we're, this is not something that we've had um, in the history of our, our sort of increased surveillance around Legionnaires uh, pneumonia. So uh, I think we're definitely, the investigation is gonna be really important and follow up to sort of better assess what the real source of this, uh, this, this uh, new cluster is about. Okay, well this is a conversation we, I think we, we, we're anxious to have. Uh, your investigation results will help inform it, but it feels like an unresolved. I think that's right. Yeah. I think that, we, that a lot of what we would be sort of talking about would be pure conjecture until we have more definitive answers from the investigation. I, I, I just have one more big picture, picture question and then I'll pass it to our, our colleague, um, Councilmember Powers. Um, New Yorkers see a graph like, uh, this one, which shows the bars going up, the number of cases going up. And they say, well, you know, the city council passed this law. We're investing six point something million dollars a year in surveilling and responding to these, and the numbers are still going up. Um, what's, the, what's the explanation here? So I think that there's a lot of explanations and it's multifactorial, so I'll try to give you some ideas of some of them. So one of the really important things that happened with Local Law 77 and the outreach that's gone around um, you know, our, our community clusters is that the message has gone out to medical providers that um, Legionella is out there and that it's important to screen for Legionella in individuals who have pneumonia. So now I'll just back off for one second to remind you that Legionella is uh, a common enough cause, though not a very common cause, of pneumonia that every first line regimen recommended by any by any organization or uh, or guidelines committee for pneumonia includes coverage for Legionella 
So they all, all, those, all those antibiotic regimens include that coverage because it's a possibility uh, uh, as one of the causes of community-acquired pneumonia. So um, within just a couple of years, the uh, amount of, of urine Legionella antigen testing, which is the main test that people use because it's easy and fast, has increased by about 43%. And so if you test more, you potentially will find more. So that's one piece of the picture. Um, the other piece of the picture is that um, we're not the only ones experiencing increases in Legionella pneumonia around the country. Of, of uh, jurisdictions that are reporting these data, 83% of them have reported an increase in, uh, in Legionella pneumonia um, in the last few years. Um, there are a lot of reasons why this may be happening. Um, one of them may be, um, and, and again, we're going very big picture now. One of them may be um, that there's warming of the climate and potentially more environments where Legionella may be able to live happily and then potentially cause disease. And then there's also the factor that um, one of the great pieces of extending people's lives is that they live longer, but then they also have longer time at risk for Legionella. So there's more people who are sort of living um, better healthy lives, but who are in age categories that may increase their risk for Legionella and also potentially may take, be taking therapies that may reduce their immune system uh, and potentially increase their risk. So it's one of those medical answers that is sometimes unsatisfying, that there are multiple reasons why it may be. Some of them have to do with uh, Mother Nature, and some of them have to do with the amazingly good messaging the Department of Health and City Council have done in getting people aware of Legionella pneumonia and getting uh, getting tested for it. Um, thank you for that. I, I assume also that with new construction, there's more internal air conditioning out there and more cooling towers that may also be a factor. I just I, don't I really assume. have data on that. I assume. Yeah, Perhaps, but I think it's also really important to recognize that we're in just in a completely different place than we were in in 2015 when the council enacted um, this robust, really um, groundbreaking law. You will all remember in the South Bronx, we didn't know where the cooling towers were. Um, we now know where they are. We are still, as you noted, we are still on the lookout for unregistered towers, but the vast majority of cooling towers are now known to us. Buildings have plans. They have vendors ready to do remedial action. So now when uh, my colleagues in disease control with their extremely sophisticated system very early on get a signal, we are, our group teams are working together really within hours. We are out there within hours. We know where to look and we know how to direct those and, buildings. And, and, we, and we appreciate that and, and I acknowledge that. Um, we just want this bar graph to start bending in the other direction. That's what we want. That's what the public wants. Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I was late. I uh, I wanted to just follow up on um, and to to the degree you have information because I know it's also Department of Corrections. There was two incidents last week at Rikers Island uh, where uh, folks were contracted Legionnaires, and I was wondering if you could give us any new information or any updates on what happened, the source, and any other steps being taken to make sure that it doesn't continue to you know, people don't continue to get Legionnaires. So I'll start with an update. Um, so w Rikers, the, the building has been really very similar to stories of other building and uh, water investigations. So our surveillance system uh, detected there were two cases within 12 months that were related to the same building ID number. So that triggers for us uh, an investigation into the, uh, the uh, an evaluation of the water in a building where these two cases could occur. Now, I'll also back up and say thousands and thousands of people go through this building every year. Um, so in an abundance of caution, even though there's so much throughput in that building, we still go and pursue a uh, building evaluation just like we would any building, whether it's at Rikers or um, another part of the city. So um, once we see that signal, we discuss with our environmental health colleagues who then um, reach out to Department of Corrections to come up with a plan for sampling 
um, the, the water in the environment, as well as coming up <laughs> with strategies to reduce risk of exposure. The most common way that in a building with a, a, a hot water system being evaluated that we perceive people to be uh, exposed to water mist is through showers. So we worked really closely um, with Department of Corrections to come up with a strategy to alter some showers to reduce water mist so that inmates who were at, and, and employees who um, were identified as potentially by themselves having risk for Legionella, so over 50, tobacco smoker, weakened immune system, et cetera, um, would have an option for bathing that would reduce mist exposure. Um, while we were in the process of doing that, um, we have just, um, I think it was on Friday, got um, our, our uh, samples. So cultures are cooking. They're gonna take a couple of weeks, but we also remediated um, with just local disinfection, a couple of shower heads that we wanted to make sure um, were clean while we were waiting for data. So um, in a, that's a long-winded way of saying we're still in the midst of the investigation, but have provided appropriate guidance for inmates and employees for how to mitigate what is probably already a very, very low risk and just a follow-up question you had you had made a, uh, a mention the question I have which is you have thousands of people who use that go well go into that jail facility every single year and use the showers and so forth so can you identify why it's only two then if if it's being heavily used and it's a shower and people are using it all the time is it is it the risk factors with the the individual is it but what, what is the, what would be the explanation for why yeah I mean, I think the explanation is that we're really aggressive in investigating when there's anything more than one case per building. Um, it may be seen potentially as overkill that we're sort of pursuing um, pursuing an investigation based on two cases given the throughput in that building. But you know, we we stay true to our criteria, no matter where that uh, what what building it, we, we see a signal in. We pursue to make sure, in an abundance of caution, that the water uh, hot water supply in that building um, is is not potentially a source of disease. So a lot of it is theoretical. A lot of it is based on potentials. And so those two cases alone are enough to trigger the investigation um, and pursuing sort of what the water is looking like, the hot water is looking like in that building. Um, so really, I'll also restate that we have about eight to 10 of these investigations of buildings per year, and there are thousands and thousands. Well, we heard about a million buildings in New York City. So they actually tend to be pretty rare. And despite uh, the fact that we do these investigations in an abundance of caution, we've never linked the uh, water from a building to these little duets of cases that we see in buildings. So again, it has to do that with the fact that New York City is hypervigilant and we really wanna ensure the safety of New Yorkers especially and including the vulnerable New Yorkers who are going through Rikers. Thank you, and just one follow-up question, or I think it's a two-parter, but um, what is the, the requirement that you go inspect twice when there's an incident, two incidents that seem to be related? Is that what it is? Can you tell, just explain the threshold, and also, is that your own, is that, a, is that an agency determination, or is that a local law that uh, cr create that? The second question would be just to information on how far apart were those two incidences uh, from each other? Um, so I'm going to um, start with the first question, which is our, th our threshold of two. Um, so I, let me actually ask one quick question. One second, so I make sure I'm asking is uh, answering accurately. So the, the threshold of two cases within 12 months is one that is uh, that comes from the CDC. So we're actually pursuing the, that standard. Um, so we um, have high fidelity to our, uh, our own protocols for uh, dealing with those two cases. So when we see two cases, we then pursue a building investigation. And the second question was um, how, how far the cases were apart. I have to, one, I, I, I need to ask one quick question. So you're asking, are you asking specifically about the two cases in Rikers good, or right, in good, general? No, no, it's, well, good question. The, the, two, the two at Rikers specifically, how far apart were they from each other? Because it's a 12-year, it's a 12-month period. So was it, you know, the same week or was it, uh, you know, 12 months apart? I know the answer, but because of patient confidentiality, I'm not allowed to reveal it, which is what I was consulting about just to make sure. But yeah, un unfortunately, I can't give you that data. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions by my colleagues, we're going to call the next panel. I want to thank you so much for your 
very in-depth and thorough testimony. So I'd like to call the next panel, uh, Laura Belt Panamar Panamarev. Huh? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Russell Bastick. And Darren Klein. Sure. So she can uh, join when she come when she comes back. You may begin your testimony when you're ready. I just ask you to identify yourself. building, oh, that's better, a small residential building uh, to a large commercial building is that the violations are reducing. Some of the buildings in the beginning were getting in excess 13, 14 violations from the start. I'm happy to report that nearly in every case they're down to two or three violations or uh, sometimes, most of the time, we're getting zero violations at this point because we have been vigilant, we have been listening to the Department of Health and all their inspectors. So I'm pretty happy to report that if you have a responsible water treatment company responsible to compliance, um, I feel very confidently that uh, we're seeing a reduction in uh, violations and also a more vigilant building owner who cares about the property and uh, they are not looking to avoid um, violations by paying the violations for the most part. I wouldn't say, I can't say if there's nobody doing that, but certainly on the most, for the most part, they are not doing that. The cost associated with the violation is more than the cost associated with the compliance aspect and the testing of Legionella and the increase in products that are used to combat Legionella and the, and the also cleaning that they should be doing at least twice a year on these cooling towers. Uh, on the comment of other sources, um, cooling towers, yes, is a major source of the spread of Legionella bacteria. Um, in the summertime, especially, there's a, other, other sources from anything from down the shore to misting in, in Great Adventure and all the other amusement parks. Um, to showers, to fountains, to a lot of other places, and that's probably why the Department of Health waits for that second case to pop up, because you don't know if this was contracted at another location versus the building itself. Um, as far as tower cleaning costs, I can add some um, more definitive numbers. It depends on the actual size and complexity of the cooling towers, but they're generally cleaned within uh, with two to two to two people to approximately six people to clean a cooling tower. Uh, the, the rates are somewhere around uh, twenty-five hundred to three thousand dollars per crew, so it could be as high as nine thousand to ten thousand dollars to clean a cooling tower, or as low as about twenty-five hundred dollars. 
and also the disinfection work that should go on during the cleaning is approximately $200 per thousand gallons of water within these cooling systems. Um, to comment on mist elimination, and you were discussing filtration of the outside of these cooling towers, uh, cooling towers are fitted, nearly all cooling towers are fitted with mist elimination so that the water st actually stays in the cooling towers if they are not properly maintained and replaced as required, that's when the mist actually leaves the cooling tower and gets drawn in through uh, fresh air intakes into the buildings. And if that um, would actually get into the ventilation system and proliferate in condensate pans or something where water builds up in the ventilation system, this could, could uh, reflect a problem. But currently there's uh, I've seen screening on towers, but nothing ex exorbitant that holds in the midst of these towers in my 30 years experience working in this. As far as the comments of defective units making clusters in New York, um, it is not just the cooling towers that need to be maintained. It's the entire system that needs to operate properly, meaning that you must um, run all the units within the cooling season. So if you have one chiller hooked to a cooling tower system and you don't run the other, it's sitting there as a stagnant piece of equipment. The building owners and building um, supers need to be educated and need to be understand the actual mechanics of their systems. There's plenty of redundant equipment, and in the law, in local law 77, it does call for 24-7 operation of all of the water within the building unless you can prove how your um, water management plan can eliminate Legionella growth from proliferating in the system. So it's more than just the tower needing maintenance. It's also the entire system running of uh, auxiliary pumps, auxiliary chillers, auxiliary heat exchangers, auxiliary package units for cooling. You know, as, as it gets cooler in the cooler months, parts of these systems start shutting down, start turning off, and that's what creates a, a prolifer proliferation, uh, proliferation of this bacteria. Um, the last comment I want to make is that I don't know if it's known to this committee, but there has been significant changes in the domestic water coming to these buildings in New York, mainly in Manhattan, some of the outer boroughs, and definitely in the Bronx. What this means to the, to the building owners and this Legionella thing is there's new water mains opening and closing, bringing in Croton water instead of Catskill that's been being uh, used for domestic drinking water and cooling towers for years. Uh, prior to the outbreak in the Bronx in 2015, there was a new water line brought online to the Bronx. Don't know if it is, uh, I can't speak if it has any correlation to Legionella, but I will tell you that when you're turning things on, turning things off in 100-year-old pipes, you are um, definitely, um, you're definitely disorganizing all the material that's in those pipes. If you were to ever to look inside a pipe, a 100-year-old pipe in New York City, it's strands of iron. That's uh, filamentous iron just hanging down in the middle of the pipe. It looks, you would never drink out of that pipe if you ever looked at it. It looks that bad. But also when you, when you change things, when you change water sources, when you bring water up through the 48 wells that are in Manhattan, uh, that can significantly change um, what's going on. I am not suggesting that New York City water is causing the Legionella problem in all these buildings, but I'm saying when you turn things off and turn things on just as if you do in a cooling system, you could be causing the same exact problem within the domestic water system. And if you turn on a water main in the Bronx and you get several cluster cases in the Bronx, after two months after a new water main has gone online, there might be some correlation with moving, moving that particular water. Um, I have reached out to the DEP to try to get some kind of um, 
some kind of information on why the water keeps changing. It, it, it's significant, and it will cost these owners, not even in just Legionella, it'll cost them significantly in water. There will be pieces of equipment that will be going down, failing, and uh, the capital cost to these building owners will be so significant, by far outweighing any water treatment, any tower cleanings, any, anything else as far as maintenance goes. We will physically ruin three quarters of the boilers in this, in this city if the water does not maintain stability that it has for 20, 28 years of my existence in New York City. And I am uh, deeply concerned that the water must maintain the quality that it's been. These buildings in New York City have been designed based on the water quality that comes into the city. To change it now is gonna create significant significant problems, significant uh, increases in water uses. These boilers and cooling towers run on cycles of concentration. Right now, to have a, a, to have a efficient running system for a cooling tower, you're using the water 10 times. With this new water that comes in, you'll be using the water two and a half to three times, meaning that you will increase the water usage by a factor of three coming into these buildings. That's significantly gonna, re gonna require some new resources. Um, I know they were talking about some filtration projects and so forth. Imagine if you use three times the amount of water that you're using today because of the change. So that's all my comments. I hope that they were useful and helpful. I'm sure my colleagues here will be able to uh, further go on, on those. Um, th 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 those were very useful, uh, quite alarming reports on the change in water quality, which we've heard about. Uh, the implications are, are way beyond uh, Legionnaires. In fact, it's, it's not entirely clear to me there's necessarily a Legionnaires connection there. I'm, I'm, I would be at a miss to say that there actually is one, but, but it, it, it is uh, alarming to find that when the water mains change and you have a cluster, it's, it's concerning to me. But I, I think when you Chair Constantinides, who chairs the Environmental Committee, oversees DUP, DEP about this. Has DEP offered answers or explanations to date? Uh, we did have some explanation of that they did open the Croton Reservoir to the outskirts of Manhattan. Uh, they showed a map of the actual water mains. Um, I, did I did submit it to the committee, but uh, that has since changed. The water has gone back and forth at least two or three times since June of 2018. Uh, they did this at a water shortage back in 2010 for about six months. They changed, to, uh, they changed reservoirs. Uh, we have that documented, but uh, the DEP does not send out a regular response that anything is changing. And we have, to, we have boots on the ground. We have uh, over 25 people in New York City that's testing water every single day. So. Um, we are actually setting up electronic alerts to tell us, we're putting probes in domestic water lines to actually tell us when a, an area of the city is actually changing. Okay, we, we do want to let your colleagues also testify, and I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Mark Joni, as well as Councilmember Margaret Chen. Um, I, I, did, I did want to ask just one thing. You, yes. you mentioned um, that in the cooler months when those cooling towers ultimately go offline, uh, in your estimation, what's the correct amount of time that they should be either serviced or, or inspected before proper usage when they've been down for three months or whatever, the winter, probably more, five months, that there's no usage and then you start them up? What's the likelihood that the reservoirs in them now have a stagnant uh, uh, particles that could cause legionnaires. What's the, what's the, so the one, you know, it, it seems to me, like I'm not, I'm not an engineer or scientist, but it seems to me that there would be some sediment. Correct. So let me put you at ease, first of all. The, the uh, local law 77 does cover this fact. If, you, if a cooling tower is going to be offline for more than five days, there's a complete protocol that must take place, including cleaning, inspecting, legionella testing, and disinfecting. Uh, the same holds true for startup. As far as that goes, you cannot turn on, turn on a cooling tower if it has not been cleaned, disinfected, inspected, and Legionella tested. 
So your laws do cover that, um, but I would say the likelihood is that um, um, there could be something there if something is sitting stagnant for the period of uh, November t through April. I think more of the more of the concern is the when it goes from 70 degrees to 40 degrees, and pieces of the system actually shut down during that time frame. Things go off on uh, temperature. You cannot run a system that's operating a thousand tons when you only need you know a hundred tons of cooling. So parts of the system need to shut down, and uh, this is done automatically. It's not even done manually. Just can't run the same equipment. So what we do, and what most responsible water treaters do, is they make sure the entire system is running on the days and times when the biocides go in. So they turn the system on, maybe from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., make sure the chemical circulates, and then they go back down to a, a dormant situation. That's the best, that's the best that you know, anybody can do. And it does well. It does work well, no doubt. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Levine and uh, Carnegie Jr. and members of the committees on the health and housing and buildings. My name is Darren Klein. I am the Director of Technology and Science for the Alliance to Prevent Legionnaires' Disease. I appreciate this opportunity to provide testimony today regarding the four bills. The Alliance is a nonprofit public health advocacy group dedicated to reducing the occurrence of Legionnaires' disease. We promote public research, education, best practices for water management, and advocating for comprehensive public water supply strategies to combat this preventable disease. I understand that intros Mr. 1149. Mr. Klein, I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm sorry. sorry to That's cut okay. you off. You're doing great. I just know that we have a colleague, uh, Councilmember Cabrera, who has to leave in a minute and just wanted to make, I think, a comment very quickly. Absolutely. I, yeah. As you know, we, I was here earlier and uh, you asked uh, a really important question to the Department of Health, and you asked our committee to, to check, and my office did, and it was in regards to uh, the dismissals and uh, the outcome of all the oath um, uh, tickets issued as a result of a water tank, uh, and the answer we were given uh, was less than correct because uh, the answer that we were giving actually essentially was that we had to check with OAF. Uh, but the department, my office has confirmed, the Department uh, of Health, uh, and as a matter of fact, every agency of the city of New York uh, that writes summonses uh, to OAF gets an automatic feed uh, from OAF every night, uh, pending the numbers of dismissals and penalty penalties involved, and those who don't have computer access, they actually get a CD. So actually, the Department of Health does have that answer, and they get it on a daily basis. So I just wanted to make that point of correction. Very, very disappointing that they weren't able to produce those important numbers. Thank you for clarifying that. We'll have to pursue that. Thank you. And, and sorry, Mr. Klein, uh, for the interruption. No, that's uh, okay. Very important. Up. Please, please yep. continue. Sure. Uh, so I understand that intros 1149, 1158, and 1164 aim to increase compliance with Local Law 77 of 2015. However, we remain concerned that due to its very narrow focus, even 100% compliance with the law will not result in a reduction of Legionnaire's disease cases in New York City. This fact was made evident in the presentation provided by your former Director of Building Water Oversight, Dr. Chris Crawford, at the Second Committee on Management of Legionella and Water Systems at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C., where he provided a presentation that New York City had over 90% compliance with the law. But he failed to note that Legionnaires' rates continues to skyrocket. It is anticipated that New York City will have 600 cases of Legionnaires' disease this year, well over your average. Clearly, compliance with Law 77 in New York City has not reduced LD cases. However, we do strongly support the direction that Intro 1166 takes by calling on the city and health and building departments to assess all potential determinants of Legionnaire's disease in the city 
including potential sources and associated risk factors, with a report to the council and mayor within one year. Specific to this bill, we have included our recommendations for what such an assessment should include and policy changes that could result in a meaningful impact on LD rates across the city. First, equipment-focused requirements will not address New York City's LD issues. Legionnaire's disease has plagued New York City for years and rates continue to climb. Since enactment of Local Law 77, which is exclusively focused on building equipment that uses the publicly supplied water flowing in and throughout their buildings, LD rates are at their highest. Recently, several outbreaks have hit the city and dangerous levels of Legionella bacteria have been found at NYCHA operated and other buildings across the city. For review, I have a chart which demonstrates year to date the LD rates in New York City. You have that in your folder. Um, as compared to recent years. While the health department continues to tout its response efforts, we are seeing the highest rates of LD per capita in the country and New York City is expected to reach an all-time high this year. The health department responds to this, saying the increased rates are due to increased awareness and diagnosis, but LD rates declined in 2016, the year following the outbreak the largest outbreak in New York City when awareness was high. And I have a chart for that as well. You can look at that. Further, national experts agree that there has been and continues to be an actual spike in rates over the last decade, likely due to aging infrastructure and aging and more susceptible population and other factors. The overwhelming number of LD cases are sporadic in nature. 96% of cases, in fact, are single or sporadic according to the Federal Center of Disease Control for which epidemiology points to the drinking water. A recent article in the New York Post revealed that the DEP is switching water supplies in the Catskills due to work on an aqueduct, and the water quality complaints have started to come in. I would venture to say that the cases of LD will see a large spike as well during this water change. It is quite common to see increases in LD rates after major events. According to the CDC, about 35% of all Legionnaire's outbreaks can be attributed to events which take place outside the building, including disruptions due to construction or water main breaks and even excessive rain. Such events disrupt Legionella bacteria that live in biofilm in the piping of public distribution systems, pushing a slug of the bacteria into homes and buildings as water enters them for use. Therefore, proper management and monitoring of the water from source to tap is critical to tackle waterborne illness like LD and others. We would note that New York City is one of five localities in the country that has been granted a waiver from filtering its water by the federal EPA. While a filtration plan has been recently installed, which filters 20 to 30% of the city's water, the remainder is unfiltered and treated with UV. We believe this should not be an either or situation. Filter all the city water. I recently returned from meetings with city officials in Vancouver, Canada. They use both filtration, UV, and high chlorine levels throughout their distribution system. Vancouver is known for pristine nature of their water and their LD rates are very low. As part of the assessment called for in entry 1166, we recommend that water source, distribution systems and piping, building management, and water using equipment all be studied as potential sources of Legionella bacteria. And, and, and Mr. Klein, I'm, sure. I'm sorry to jump in only because this is uh, this testimony is longer than usually uh, public would. Deliver. That wasn't given a time limit, so and, that's fine. Uh, and we do have your entire written statement, which is okay. going to be entered on the record, and okay. the staff and the chair and I have been reviewing it. Um, I I, th I think uh, we get your your point, uh, which we're we we're happy to hear. Um, I don't think anyone disputes the presence of of Legionella in drinking water. I think the commissioner himself described it as ubiquitous in the environment. That certainly includes the water. Uh, but, but he also pointed out that there's a, a very small number of cases a year which, uh, in which uh, a person contracts the disease out of the water that, that we were able to identify. He said the number was 8 to 10. Um, yeah, uh, CDC says that 96% of the cases are sporadic, which most are attributed to drinking water. So I don't, I don't know where he gets the, the data, but right. But you're not claiming that CDC someone data. takes a glass of water and drinks it and gets it. This is it's it's a, it's talking a, from shower heads, right? Like Rikers Island, we're talking about NYCHA. It's there's no cooling tower on that building, so it's in it's in the water in these public right. housing buildings. But so, so I guess you, your your assertion is that 
um, there must be single case uh, situations because if there's two, then it sets off alarms. The health department investigates. Right. But you're, there's probably more single cases out there. Right. It's the only the, you know the cluster, the outbreak, which according right. to CDC will bring in and, and the investigation. And I, I do think it would be fair just to establish you know the the, the name of your institute. <coughs> Um, alliance to Prevent Legionnaires' Disease. I mean, you, you, you definitely are not looking to focus on cooling towers, right? We're looking at the whole system. So from source to tap, which includes the cooling tower, which right. uh, is not attributed to most of the cases. Most cases are, are and, uh, drinking can, water, potable can, can water. I, can I ask, Mr. Klein, who, who are the funders of, the, of this alliance? Uh, we have several. We have um, um, the Allergy and Asthma Institute, we have the Cogency Group, which is an environmental testing agency. And we also were founded by manufacturers of cooling equipment, right. uh, experts in the field for years because we've been pointed to, so. I, I understand, but I think it's important to know that, that the cooling tower industry is largely behind this and uh, we don't minimize. Fair enough, we're the experts in the field. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by another health committee member, Dr. Matthew Eugene. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we're going to pass it off to our final witness. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Carnegie and Chairman Levine and esteemed members of the two committees. My name is Laura Belt Ponomarov and I, and I am the chair of the advocacy committee at Bowman, New York, the Building Owners and Managers Association of Greater New York. I thank you for this opportunity to testify on existing cooling tower regulations and on several proposed pieces of legislation regarding cooling towers. First, allow me to give you a little background information on Bowman, New York. Bowman, New York represents more than 750 property owners, managers, and building professionals who own or manage 400 million square feet of commercial space in New York City. We are an association within BOMA International, a federation of 90 U.S. associations and 19 international affiliates that own and operate 10.5 million square feet of office space in the United States. Back in 2015, after a deadly outbreak of Legionnaires' disease, the City Council passed Local Law 77 in record time and later added Chapter 8 of Title 24 to the rules of the City of New York to implement the bill. All or most of BOMA New York buildings had long treated cooling towers to prevent Legionella and the monitoring and treatment protocol mandated did not seem significantly different from what we were doing. So we were in a good place to comply with the new rule and laws. Nonetheless, implementation and enforcement of the law have been difficult and frustrating, even as we've continued to work closely with our partners at the Department of Health to try to surmount those difficulties. In our view, the primary issues that are, are that enforcement has been inconsistent and inspectors tend to give out a lot of penalties, primarily for what we consider small administrative matters. Many violations are in fact incorrect, and our members have spent a great deal of time at the ECB getting violations overturned. I should note, however, that it seems, and at least anecdotally, like the number of violations has dropped as of late. Meanwhile, tests routinely come back as in compliance and even non-detect. In addition, the regulations have led to significantly higher costs for monitor, monitoring and testing cooling towers. In general, we have pushed the DOH, DOH to focus less on micromanaging every building in the city and instead to work with building sectors most likely to be struggling with Legionella management. In addition, we have asked them to establish a system for approving Legionella management books that each building has to have so that there is certainty about meeting the administrative requirements of the rules and or to move the performance-based approach, to move to a performance-based approach, whereby good test results indicate the proper management practices are in place and lengthy inspections are not necessary. Neither of these approaches have yet been adopted, but we continue to have productive talks with the Department of Health about these and other matters. As for the specific laws under consideration, they tend to move in the direction of greater administrative burdens for both buildings and the city, with no clear evidence that they will actually protect health. Regarding intro 1149, we are neutral on the provision that the city notify buildings 30 days prior to require 90-day inspections. Although it seems like a significant burden that could easily take away from other city efforts and resources, as to filing all 90-day inspection reports within five days of inspection, we are opposed. First, these inspections include Legionella testing, take at least 15 days to incubate test samples and generate a test report which the lab then sends to, to a qualified person. Therefore, five days is completely unrealistic. 
In addition, currently only test results that show noncompliance need to be reported to the Department of Health. The test results and reports are extensive and will not be uploadable to the current portal due to their size. These reports and results must be kept on site for at least three years and are available to inspectors. We believe that these current reporting requirements are entirely adequate for protecting human health. Regarding Intro 1164, this bill largely cleans up and updates reporting requirements under Local Law 77 of 2015. It does, however, add the requirement that the results of each 90-day inspection be posted electronically. Again, these reports are extensive and technical, and it is not immediately clear how posting every one of them electronically will forward the goal of protecting human health. The vast majority will show compliance with Legionella results and normal functioning cooling towers. Non-compliant tests, mitigation efforts, and mitigation results are already submitted to Department of Health. Therefore, we oppose this new requirement as unnecessary and burdensome. Once again, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the oversight of cool cooling tower regulations and on these proposed laws. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, in your testimony, you speak of uh, the decrease, the recent decrease in fines. Uh, earlier, the Department of Health testified that that was directly attributed to um, the period of compliance and people getting to know the law and um, now complying. Do you agree with that, or is there another, uh, another way you'd attribute the decrease? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, the Department of Health has done a great job um, better training some of their inspectors, but some of the violations that you're seeing down at Oath, for example, I'm a building owner, and I spent half a day at Oath to clear violations that were administrative. They were actually cited for drinking water, but this was on a cooling tower violation. So some of them were cited incorrectly, and then they were dismissed. But again, they were administrative. They had nothing to do with the safety of public health, and I spent half a day down at Oath clearing a violation that had really nothing to do with public safety or health. So, um, uh, Co-Chair, they, they reported a very high number of fines. What was it, 75,000 or something? And then when we broke it down, uh, it came to find out that a lot of those, maybe the vast majority, was administrative. Was that, that that's the way I understood the Department of Health's testimony as it related to the fines and fees? Well, we, we, we actually had a breakdown uh, that our wonderful staff showed me. I guess only about 4,000 or so are being paid in full every year. A lot of them are dismissed, uh, a preponderance, um, maybe even close to half. I don't know the exact number. Right. And I, I was here during the Department of Health's um, testimony, and if I scribbled my notes correctly, um, they said 73,000 violations annually, only about 5,000 are public health violations, which is 6%. These two laws, these local laws that you're proposing are additional administrative burdens on building owners and managers. It is additional time that we spend out of our buildings protecting our tenants on a variety of different issues that come across and just add more administrative work and do not protect public health, which is the purpose of these laws. So that's why we are commenting just on these two because we oppose this additional administrative burden. Not to mention when we go to oath, there is no Department of Health representative there. So it's up to the oath court, which is under the jurisdiction of the DOB, to be trained and on these cooling towers, which is not their area. It's the Department of Health's area. So I, I just want to say I respect and appreciate that perspective on those. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. So um, we, th we thank you for your testimony. Um, it's, it, it was quite thorough and um, adds a lot to the narrative. I hope that someone from the Department of Health, we know nobody from the Department of Buildings is here, but the Department of Health was here to hear your testimony. If not, it is on the record, and uh, I will be able to cite, especially from the perspective of small business. Thank uh, you very much. That perspective. Thank you. And this hearing is adjourned.